the Millennium Challenge account, a different approach to foreign aid. Um, foreign aid is, for many people, on one level, a wonderful humanitarian enterprise. On another level, Marshall Plan in parentheses, provides great economic and political stability. And this particular effort is, as everyone knows, a little different. It's oriented largely to, to nations which are uh, practicing human rights, uh, engaged in market economics, and uh, uh, oriented towards social justice. The uh, Catholic Relief Service, service and uh, uh, Mr. Hackett uh, obviously are in tune in many ways with this. And the specific thing that we're delighted about is that he's a, uh, Mr. Hackett is a member of the board of directors of the Mill Millennium Challenge Corporation and therefore brings an authoritative voice to tonight's uh, presentation. Mr. Hackett is a graduate of Boston College, 1968. He uh, was in the Peace Corps in Ghana following that. Joined Catholic Relief Services in 1972, was first posted to Sierra Leone. He served in many of the African countries and in the Philippines, uh, as well as the headquarters in, of Catholic Relief Services many times in several capacities. He uh, became executive director in, in 1993 and president of Catholic Relief Services in 2003. And for this long, long career of humanitarian service, he's received a number of honors, two uh, uh, honorary doctorates. He's received a uh, Distinguished Service Award from the Washington Theological Union and the 2005 uh, Alumni Achievement in Religion Award from Boston College, uh, his alma mater. And he's also received uh, the distinct honor of uh, Knight Commander of the Papal Order of St. Gregory the Great, one of the uh, highest of the papal honors. We're absolutely delighted to have him with us this evening. As I said, he's on the board of directors of the Challenge Corporation. It's my great pleasure uh, to present Mr. Kenneth Hackett. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. It's, it's very much a pleasure to be back here. Um, when you put on some of these great events, um, and you continue to put them on, uh, and I'm in some funny place around the world, I'm saying I missed it once again, but uh, I, I thank you for inviting me. And thank you for acknowledging the, the CRS team that's here. They, they have filled up the audience uh, quite a bit, but if I may, I'd just like our um, regional directors um, to stand. Uh, the regional directors for Catholic Relief Services are a group of nine. They're not all here tonight. Um, but if I see some of them, Dorothy, in the back, Bill Rastetter, who's uh, been with CRS for almost as long as I have, uh, regional director currently of West Africa and moving within a month or so to be regional director in East Africa. Over to my left, Dorothy madison Sec, who is the regional director for Central Africa. Behind her, Jean-Marie Adrienne, who has been regional director in East Africa, is doing the switch with Bill Rastetter and going to Accra to be in charge of our regional office in West Africa. And our newest regional director, Michelle Bromelsek, has spent her career with us in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and most recently in Zambia, and has just been recently promoted to be regional director for Southern Africa. Thank you very much. <laughs> Last month, I had the privilege of uh, traveling to South America, to Paraguay, um, where I, uh, I guess the, the right term would be officiated in the signing of a Millennium Challenge Corporation uh, threshold grant, $34 million. The ceremony uh, was held at the National Palace, which is a rather interesting place to me. As we drove up, there were two soldiers and we drove in and said to them that we're going to see the president we had no special marks on the car or anything. And they said, OK, we drove right in. Not the kind of security you now find in so many uh, American embassies and uh, 
state houses around the world. It was a very laid back place. The president of Paraguay officiated uh, at the signing. It was attended by U.S. ambassador, ambassadors from virtually all of the South American countries and many of the European countries, all of Paraguay's major press. Um, it was a big event for this small country uh, with the capital, Asuncion. Um, it didn't make the press here. There was a lot of other important things happening, like the end of uh, American Idol, the finals were, were coming, and, and the arrival of uh, Brad and Angelina's new child. I mean, these things really occupied the media. And so they didn't focus on what was going to happen in uh, Paraguay. But as President Duarte spoke, he left everybody in that room with a clear sense that he intended this agreement to be a new way to help his country. He spoke of leading the country away from its legacy of corruption. And he spoke very openly about it. He used the terms, his hope was that his country would be known for the honesty of its citizens, the goodness of its people, and for the faith in its future. It was wonderful political rhetoric, and, and from him he made it sound uh, very genuine. But, you know, people are listening to the speech of a political candidate. But then he did something that I thought uh, was very significant. He invited each of the ministers of his government who were seated in the front row to come up to the table and sign the agreement. And he said, every one of you is accountable for the success of this program. And publicly and in front of all the cameras and all the media, I want the citizens of this nation to know that we jointly are responsible for this. It was powerful. Um, it, it was really a sense in, in this country at this time that this particular agreement, which they had put a lot of sweat and long hours into, was special. And he considered it special and others considered it special. And it was very significant. The Millennium Challenge account is an approach to foreign assistance that's not just new, it's pretty bold. In developing this approach, what its architects have done is identify the obstacles that have been in front of foreign aid for so many years. And in place of those, those hurdles that were there, they've tried to come up with a fresh and a new approach to foreign assistance, one that would ensure that U.S. foreign aid, at least, is effective, not always a term that's associated with U.S. foreign aid. Specifically, the Millennium Challenge Account provides aid to countries that have, as uh, Dr. Byrd mentioned, indicated that they're going to make a commitment to find ways to reduce poverty and to raise the standards of living for all of their citizens. MCA compacts will not only be awarded to countries that rule justly and are committed to democratic, will only be awarded to countries that rule justly and are committed to democratic principles. It's nations that invest in their people and encourage economic freedom that can participate. Each year, countries are selected for eligibility to the Millennium Challenge uh, account through a competition of sorts. Each nation is rated on 16 indicators, and the indicators are drawn from World Bank indicators, think tank indicators, WHO, and indicators that the countries themselves develop. So they're fairly rational and objective. And the process compares one country to its peers. And the nations that are selected are generally the ones that are really making difficult policy decisions about the reforms necessary to improve the situation for their people. The nations that are putting themselves on the fastest track to poverty reduction. This source of funds and this piece of legislation 
is managed by a new corporation called the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and that's where I come in, as, as Frank said. The agency, um, the board of that corporation, currently uh, consists of seven people. It's chaired by the Secretary of State. The vice chair is the Secretary of Treasury, which eventually will be Henry Paulson. It um, has on it the U.S. Trade Representative, um, at least right now it's the designated U.S. Trade Representative, Susan Schwab, the Administrator of the Agency for International Development, Randall Tobias, uh, and then the CEO of the corporation, John Danilovich. And then there are two um, non-governmental board members. Actually, there are a provision for four, but we've only had two for the last uh, two years. Um, Christy Todd Whitman of New Jersey is uh, one who was the EPA administrator and the governor of New Jersey, and myself. So it's kind of a tight little crew. And when I was um, nominated by the Senator Daschle, the um, Senate minority leader at the time because the nomination process is both sides of the aisle, one from the Senate side, one, uh, one, two from the Senate side on both sides of the aisle and two from the House side. Um, I agreed to engage in it because I knew it was going to be a, a time-consuming undertaking based on um, two basic provisions. Uh, I wanted to make sure that, uh, first and foremost, this new effort, this major undertaking, stuck to the real conceptual provisions of reducing poverty. That's why it was developed. I didn't want to see any deviation, at least if I had anything to say about it. I believe that economic growth is absolutely necessary um, for poverty reduction, but I don't think it's totally sufficient for poverty reduction. And over my 38 years of working in, in international development, I'm convinced that while you need economic growth in a country to, to begin to spur changes, you need a lot of other things as well. And I wanted to make sure that this new effort stuck to that provision and just didn't wander onto the economic growth path, leaving behind the poverty reduction path. The other principle that I felt if the board would allow me to focus on was to ensure that other elements of civil society in the countries that we were working were engaged in this process the people affected by the plans who would be impacted by the investments should have a say. They should have a say in thinking about what the investments would be, possibly even drafting the proposals. And I think many of you know that historically governments have received the lion's share of bilateral and multilateral aid, and government-to-government -government funding uh, has typically made, been made through channels that really are not open to the general public. Nobody knows what the money is coming to this country or that and how much is coming, where it's going to. It just has not traditionally and historically been an open process. Citizens have been left out. And uninformed and uninvolved, the public in many of these countries is totally unable to hold its government accountable. So what I wanted to do in this process, and it is written into the legislation, is to engage as much as possible and to ensure that civil society in these countries is engaged in the whole process of the, the um, allocation of these funds. Likewise, here in the United States, all of the organizations that are interested in foreign assistance should have a role in some way of watching what's going on through my presence on the board. And so I take it very seriously that I have to spend time, and my assistant, Jamie Davis, who's here someplace as well, 
spend time in informing the other agencies that are engaged in international development, the CARE, the Save the Children, the Lutherans, the World Relief, all of the others who have some interest in seeing that real poverty reduction happens, we keep them informed and keep them engaged. I've stated that I believe the Millennium Challenge account is fundamentally different from previous foreign aid assistance initiatives. Let me say a few words about how I think it's different. First, it starts uh, with a performance-based approach. Uh, those 16 indicators are developed there. As I say, reasonably objective, pretty rational, and you can compare. They're not totally objective because there are things like levels of primary girls' education, um, number of days to start a business. There's some relativity in them, but they're just about as good as we get right now. So every country is compared within its economic uh, class. They are compared to each other. And that helps take away some of the arbitrariness. And if countries don't measure up and they miss on some of the indicators, they're not punished per se. They're encouraged because the Millennium Challenge account is also about incenting countries to improve. And for those countries that miss, maybe one indicator, they're just not up to the mark, there's a small program that we have called the Threshold Program, and it provides modest grants for countries that need to work on a particular indicator. It's got to improve the rates of girls' education or investment in, in health facilities. Um, let's see if we can help that country improve so that it can later qualify for another major grant. That's what I went and did in Paraguay. The, the Paraguay program was to invest in improvements in uh, the tax control procedures, the um, border control, um, to make sure that smuggling stops. Smuggling actually has a negative impact on poor farmers because things are coming in from Brazil and Argentina at a lower cost than can be produced in the country, uh, to improve the accountability uh, of the judiciary, particularly in rural areas, things like that. Not big investments, but investments that hopefully will bring Paraguay up to a point where they'd qualify for a major investment by the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Countries that qualify will lose their eligibility and their funding if their scores fall. And we had a couple of examples over the last year where, for instance, the country of Yemen qualified. They were ready to receive a threshold grant and the scores deteriorated. The, the, the civil situation and the political situation in the country just went downhill very rapidly and we could see that it was going to go downhill further, we cut them out. And the same thing has happened, well, may happen, but we have put Armenia on notice that uh, their money will be stopped unless there are improvements in uh, engaging the public in a, a wider political process. So the Millennium Challenge Corporation also follows those people who are not measuring up even after they originally qualified. Interestingly, we have noticed a, a kind of a positive phenomenon among, among countries that have not qualified for MCA but are still striving for eligibility. It's been dubbed the MCC incentive effect and we've discovered that countries uh, are indeed reforming their policies and adopting practices that uh, will improve their performance in the qualifying indicators. Two Harvard researchers came out with a recent paper about two months ago, and uh, the paper's titled, Can Foreign Aid Create the Incentive for Good Governance? And they found, and I'll quote them, even though the Millennium Challenge Corporation is still in its infancy, we find substantial evidence that countries improve their indicators because of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Candidate countries, countries that are potential recipients of MCC funds, are more likely to improve their performance on indicators used by the MCC and display greater absolute increases 
on these indicators. Overall, candidate countries reformed approximately 25 percent more indicators after the creation of the Millennium Challenge Corporation than before it. So it's having an impact even beyond those countries that are now receiving money. The second big benefit I see of the Millennium Challenge account is that the partner countries take ownership for the projects. They design them. They conceive them. This is not um, what has often been a historical uh, arrangement where something is dreamt up, a new approach is dreamt up in Washington or in Paris or in Bonn uh, or in New York at the UN and offered to the countries. We're going to focus on environment or we're going to focus on this, that or the other thing and that changes over time. With the Millennium Challenge account, basically the burden is thrown on the countries. What is it that you want to do that will improve the, sit the economic situation in the country and directly impact on poverty reduction? You come up with the plan. Also, Millennium Challenge account does not have earmarks. And earmarks, um, which have been assigned by Congress over the years, have really tied up a lot of foreign aid in, in really a, a frazzle. USAID has so many earmarks on its money, and it decreases really the value of the input and increases the cost. And happily, the uh, Millennium Challenge isn't burdened with that. The Millennium Challenge account isn't intended to be used for short-term political gains. And that's usually the first question I get. But isn't this really something that is in an indirect way fighting terrorism here or uh, being used like other forms of foreign aid? That's not to say that there is not discretion in the board, but really we try to use the indicators, we try to use quantitative measures to the maximum extent possible. Because we know that all too often short-term political gains have taken precedent over long-term poverty reduction goals. And I think that was most evident during the Cold War, but still exists. And finally, the Millennium Challenge account encourages economic growth that reduces poverty. And let me give you a specific example. <clears throat> Benin is a small country in West Africa. To some of you who are my age, uh, it used to be called Dahomey. And a country of seven million people, um, over the last decade relatively peaceful, although it had its share of coup d'etats in the 60s and the 70s after independence. And basically, um, you've got a, a seven million person population, at least a third of them are in a state of abject poverty. And most of those people live in the northern part of the country. Benin had gone through actually a, a rather interesting process of reflecting on where it was going. And that process was stimulated about four or five years ago by the World Bank's highly indebted country initiative, the HIPIC initiative. And that initiative encouraged countries to come up, very much like the Millennium Challenge, with a, a focus on the future on what they would do if their debt burden was relieved. And uniquely, I would say, Benin did this in consultation and in broad consultation with a lot of their population, with their civil society groups, with their unions, with their um, all kinds of women's groups, uh, church groups, agricultural co-ops, and they put together a rather interesting uh, proposal for the future and submitted it to the World Bank, and I think they did get some debt relief. But they used that process to design the program that they submitted to the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And they recognized in it that we've got a lot of problems, but we've got two basic ones that maybe we should try to address. First, the investment climate in Benin is abysmal. There is nobody who would bring 
investment into that country. The port didn't work. You can't export well. It's corrupt. There's, uh, the judiciary is, you can't uh, resolve any crisis. They said, we recognize it. We realize we've got to improve it. And secondly, um, they said that we've got to activate the private sector, private farmers, private business. Uh, for too long, this has been a statist country. They fiddled with Marxist-Leninism in the 70s, and that legacy lingers on so that the government controlled everything. And this is the government saying this. And so they decided that uh, for the Millennium Challenge account proposal, they would take a new approach. They would focus on four critical sectors. They said, we've got to focus on the land issues. The poor people live in the north. They don't have title to their land. Because they don't have title to the land, they can't use the land as collateral. They can't expand it. They're not sure whether they should invest further. And the only opportunities they have right now is cotton, because it's financed by uh, multilateral corporations which underwrite their costs. So it's a monoculture. But if we could do something about uh, securing their property rights and reducing the time and title, uh, the time and cost of getting title to their lands, that could open up new opportunities for poor farmers. To do that, also, we've got to add. Uh, access to financial services and credit. The banking system is located primarily in the capital cities. It doesn't reach out to poor areas, doesn't take any risk. It's certainly not, not going to loan to somebody who has no collateral. So we've got to expand the access to credit around the country and financial services. They said the judicial system doesn't work in the rural areas. So we have to do something about that, because how are we going to process the land titling issues and other issues if people don't feel they can get a just shake from the courts? And lastly, they said, um, if we could improve the port of Cotonou, which my shipping people say is one of the most corrupt of all the ports we ship to, that would change things. First of all, it would compete with Nigeria's port and we would be able to uh, possibly export and import at a lower cost. If we could import at a lower cost, uh, it would impact on inflation. If we could export without all the extra charges that you get trying to export out of the, some of these countries, that would improve things for the farmers and others. So we want to invest in a port. And I think the way we looked uh, at this proposal that the government of, of Benin brought to us is that these things all had to fit together. There had to be a complementarity. There had to be a synergy. Because just improving the port without improving the productive side, making the, the populations better able to produce and export is not going to get anything. And they came with a, I would say, a, a wonderful proposal that made a big difference. We funded it for over $300 million. And um, that sounds like a lot of money. It would be a lot of money in this city if we could get uh, become a member of the, our proposal into the MCC. But basically, the, the Millennium Challenge Corporation with the country will oversee the expenditures and make sure that they're focused on what the original intent was. Now that the MCA has gotten off the ground in a way and has a bit of a track record. What's it accomplished? We're two years into this initiative. To my mind, the greatest accomplishment so far is that we've gone from an idea to an institution. This was a startup. It was proposed by the president um, with good advice. And, and I, I must say that CRS and, and many of the other agencies like us were, were calling for something like this. And he responded. Um, but it was an idea. The Millennium Challenge uh, now has uh, a staff functioning in Washington of about 300. A, we have 23 
compacts or agreements that we're working on. Um, 23 different countries, and these are all sizable compacts in the two and 300 and 400 million dollar level. There are 18 countries that have qualified for the, or are participating in the threshold country. These are the smaller grants to help improve things so that you can move up to the bigger grants. And we have six of those, um, so, some in uh, interesting countries, poor countries, Burkina Faso, Mali, Tanzania, Albania, Paraguay. And all together, we've committed $1.6 billion. At the same time, I realize that um, particularly over the last year, there's been some criticism of this new initiative. Um, criticizing the initiative, the concept, and the performance. And uh, in, in many ways, I found myself on the board at least a year ago hard-pressed to defend it. One of the criticisms that this was all happening too slow. Why wasn't, excuse me, why wasn't the money moving out the door? In fa fact, that criticism came from the White House, as well as other places. And for my money, I said, wait a minute, why isn't the money moving out the door? It sure, surely will look politically better if more money moves out the door, but is that the right way to do things? The right way to do things is to do it right, to be diligent, to put the energy and the time in, to make sure that the concepts really work and they're not just uh, wonderful ideas. There were also criticisms um, that the program had these great ideas about uh, involving people and uh, getting community groups to speak to their national government and participate in this process. And, and some of the criticism was that these governments that you're talking to have no history in involving people. They came to power at either at the end of a gun or through some other machinations, but not necessarily through a democratic process. So they're not going to want to engage their citizenry in a, a dialogue or a discussion about this. And equally, there was criticism that in the beginning, some of the new staff that we brought on board in Washington for the Millennium Challenge Corporation, very talented, very dynamic staff, really didn't know anything about involving people. They knew a lot about doing cost benefits and economic rates of return and, and legal issues, but how to involve a peasant group and listen to them in northern Benin and find out what they think about this proposal, no experience there. But I think we've made some headway in, in all of those areas. Um, things have started to happen. The original uh, CEO uh, resigned, and uh, a new CEO was brought in, John Danilovich. He's added spark and energy to the program, and it started to move along. We brought in new staff who understand uh, what we're trying to do, I think, a little bit better. And there's clarity being sent out to the country so that it's not, what do you expect us to do? We're kind of getting to the point where now it's, it's clear. There's a, I think some of you who have been in, in some way involved in this could go on with a longer litany of criticisms uh, of anything coming out of Washington these days, um, but I'll stop there and maybe in the question and answer take, take some of those questions. We, or the, the conceptualizers called it the Millennium Challenge account for very good reason. Um, there are, the world is in a way awash with challenges um, for an organization like this. And uh, let me list two big ones that I see uh, MCA and MCC facing. The, the concept in terms of money was $5 billion a year would be invested in this effort. That's a lot of money. That's more foreign aid than, than we have ever given out uh, in a single tranche uh, 
And so it, it looked like something very, very significant. Up until now, the funding has fallen far short of that goal. Congress appropriated uh, last year $1.8 billion, and um, the President went in for the 07 budget at uh, $3 billion. I hope we come out the other end with uh, something close to that. So there never has been all the money that was originally promised. And part of it is understandable. Congress is more willing to send money overseas when it sees real results, more nations taking seriously uh, their commitment to raising the standard of living for their people and eliminating poverty and increasing economic growth when they see the results. But these results take time. The American people have, um, I think most of you in this room know, uh, a very narrow sense of uh, how much foreign aid is, how much it represents in our budget, and there's a general perception based on many studies, but uh, one major study done by the University of Maryland, that what we give is far more than what we invest in Medicare, and that's just plain wrong. So the perception out there that we're giving so much money uh, is, is is sustained, that perception maybe uh, results in, in a dialogue with uh, congressional representatives that we shouldn't be given all this money overseas, we're given too much. So that's another hurdle that we have to uh, face. And finally, when uh, the new foreign aid kid on the block arrived, there may have been less than adequate consultation with other donors. This was a big new initiative of the Bush administration, and two years ago, we weren't talking to many other people um, about things that, that the Bush administration was doing. Um, that has been significantly improved with dialogue in each country with all of the other donors uh, so that there's a coordinated approach, an approach that develops some kind of a, I'll use the word synergy again, where programs of the French would correlate well with programs of the U.S. government, the British, the Dutch, the U.N., the World Bank, and things are coming together in a, in a much better way than they did, I'd say, two years ago. Let me close in just saying that although the Millennium Challenge account is an innovative and important advancement in foreign assistance, it is not, nor will it ever be, the panacea. It's one implement in the, and, and maybe a very important one, in the toolbox of U.S. foreign assistance. Other sources of foreign aid and other approaches such as trade promotion and, and humanitarian aid are all necessary and should continue, but this represents one large and new and different approach. We've set very high standards for the Millennium Challenge account, and we expect that the MCA will help produce larger national economies for poor countries. Other foreign aid programs have endeavored to do this over the years, too, but we believe that we can go a step further because we're committed to the idea of economic growth and increased wealth that will generate real and serious and profound reductions in poverty for those people who live in such a sad state in so many places in the world. We know that special attention has to be given to the condition of women in these countries, and in each of the proposals, that issue is addressed. It's not an earmark that certain amounts of money has to go, but it is a conscious attempt to address the particular situation of uh, women in the developing countries who bear the heaviest burden of child rearing, uh, raising family and earning an income, and that is part of uh, what we look at. But raising the standards of all citizens will be the measure that will ultimately determine whether the Millennium Challenge account is truly different from other forms of international assistance. Reducing poverty will be the standard by which we gauge whether MCA is effective and whether all the time I've put into it 
has really made a difference. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It's extraordinarily informative and, and interesting. Um, I should have noted before that uh, Mr. Hackett, of course, has spoken here before. He spoke in 1994 in Rwanda and in 2004 on the Sudan crisis. Uh, but tonight we have this third and interesting topic. Uh, he's going to recognize the questioners and repeat the questions. The question, if I can sum it up, is um, basically what's new about this? Um, why are we doing it? Um, what are the, the real objectives? Um, and are there ancillary objectives that are trying to be accomplished? As I understand it, and now I, I think I can speak about meetings with the Secretary of State and others who um, have spent time thinking about this in ways that I haven't, there is a realization that foreign aid may not have been as effective as it should have been. I'm putting it in a moderate uh, phrase. <laughs> so that realization is out there. And I think, uh, just as you said, some of it went to oligarchs. Some of it went for short-term um, foreign policy objectives. Uh, some of it rewarded our friends only with no other uh, criteria. As, as I understand it and as I um, hear it explained by various people in Washington who were behind the original concept, it's about results. It's about getting away from how it was done before and is about trying to come up with a more effective way to improve the situation in these countries. You need stable countries, secure countries in order for them to be developed countries and to take care of the poverty needs uh, that are there. And until you deal with all of those things and you really invest in it, you're really not going to make a substantive change. The question is about citizen engagement and, and what uh, Catholic Relief Service is doing in, in Sudan, uh, in Darfur. I don't want to go into all of that um, unless people want to hear it, but uh, <clears throat> uh, let me start by saying Sudan does not qualify for the Millennium Challenge uh, account. <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's something about the human rights record and the indicators. Um, but uh, that's the kind of thing we look at, whether there is uh, a government that is ruling justly and engaging its people in an honorable way in uh, the governance uh, of the country and, and, uh, and, and the participation in, in the governance uh, and citizen process. Um, so. It's, it's, to me, vital. It's what we do here in our own country. And, and in fact, it's very interesting when uh, we've met with some of the delegations coming in from the MCA countries, um, they find it very strange that somebody from Catholic Relief Services is involved in this government effort. And it, it takes a, a bit of discussion, uh, but we're attempting to mirror something here that we hope they will mirror there. And in each country and in each compact, we have encouraged them to have advisory boards of citizen groups. Uh, the group I met in Paraguay were um, a lot of hu human rights lawyers um, and others who would provide oversight uh, to the, the program on behalf of uh, the MCC. So we're trying to engage them as much as possible. The question is how uh, the MCA is viewed by George Soros and Melinda Gates uh, and or the Gates Foundation. Uh, I can't say. I can't give you a, a precise answer to that. There hasn't been a. You alluded to it earlier in your comments that you should have engaged them perhaps more in the formation. What I was uh, alluding to earlier was bilateral and multilateral donors rather than private uh, donors. Um, Soros has done some marvelous things in supporting civil society efforts around the world, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, um, and they are very commendable. So the groups that he has supported, we would hope they would engage in 
oversight and watchdogging the Millennium Challenge Corporation, stuff he's done in Georgia and Armenia. Um, with Gates, I, they really haven't focused, as far as I know, on this type of economic development activity. They have focused very profoundly, and I would say are leaders in uh, specific areas, in certain health areas, um, to some extent in water. Uh, now we're finding them engaged in uh, emergency response. Uh, they've given us a very large grant for that. But they haven't put their money into economic development for overall poverty reduction. I think soon, I mean, as I say, it's, it's two years in the making, uh, those kind of dialogues will happen. Um, it is interesting uh, that the, uh, the singer Bono was very active in um, advocacy on issues of foreign aid and trade and AIDS, particularly around Africa, uh, made a, uh, an afternoon visit to the Millennium Challenge Corporation about a month ago. And so, I mean, he raised the visibility of the whole thing. Not that he's Bill Gates, but uh, <laughs> he's a player. Um, the question is whether CRS has the um, professional capability um, inside Catholic Relief Services to meet the uh, needs of this program. So I serve on the board of this government corporation. I'm backed up um, by people at Catholic Relief Services. Those regional directors that I introduced earlier are the ones that say uh, in their email, you're not getting the straight information about what's happening in country A or country B. We do have economists. We do have agronomists um, and uh, a raft of, of very talented and professional people in Catholic Relief Services who uh, actually we match against anybody at the World Bank because they've come from the World Bank. These were there at the outset? These were at CRS at the outset. In the establishment of this organization in Washington, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, all those people had to be hired. And they're still kind of coming up to uh, full steam. Uh, what are, the question was, what are we to make of the fact that the uh, funding has in actuality been so much lower than the President uh, initially announced? I think the first answer to that question is that um, Congress has been reticent to support foreign aid overall. The administration has asked for the money. Now maybe some would say they haven't fought hard enough for the money. Um, but we are hoping and uh, that in the 07 budget that amount will go up significantly. What do we make about it? I, I don't believe this was just a, um, I honestly don't believe this was just a political uh, act. I think it was a substantial attempt to uh, change the way foreign assistance is administered and uh, the effectiveness of it. The question is, uh, what kind of commitment does the board make, um, given that they are cabinet level uh, staff? Each of the members of the board have a designated individual working with them who have um, responsibility for day-to-day -day basis of interagency dialogue. Jamie Davis, who's my assistant here, does just that. I mean, she is in Washington meeting with the other agencies in the negotiations to make sure the Treasury is on the same page with state, is on the same page with the trade representatives people. So there's a lot of work underneath that's being done to move the decisions up. There are um, at least four board meetings a year. They go for about two hours a meeting, and they are attended um, by everybody pretty regularly. Uh, the Secretary of State hasn't missed any meeting. I mean, we go when she calls. Uh, she's the chair. But um, some of the other um, cabinet members who have been traveling or something will have an undersecretary attend on their behalf. It's also um, often on part of the meeting we have the National Security Advisor or one of his staff sit in. So it is it's rather unique that the time is, uh, these people is spent on this and they know the issues and are well briefed. And I've been impressed uh, that it's, they don't know all of the details on every proposal. None of us do. We have staff for that. 
but we're supposed to put in motion as uh, a governance structure procedures and ask the right and tough questions about how things are going. The question was, um, what are the best practices we're learning from the Millennium Challenge Corporation experience? How can they be applied in other areas? I think they're already being applied in, in many um, arenas, both in the international development um, arena, at the bilateral and multilateral uh, level, and then at the country level. And, and specifically, I would say that this whole concept of having objective and verifiable indicators in order to gain access to something, we think that's, that's having an impact. Um, DFID, the British uh, Development Agency, has, has made some headway in this regard and maybe in some ways have gone even further than the U.S. But we think that some of the others, the French, the Dutch, the Japanese, are finding that model quite interesting. Secondly, the, uh, the focus on results that foreign aid is not just, as I use the Taiwan case, of just rewarding somebody or trying to curry a country's favor. It should be about accomplishing something. And hopefully it'll be about accomplishing a reduction in poverty and improved uh, economic growth situation. So I can't say precisely that I have an example where Dutch aid has adopted all of the procedures of the MCC, but the dialogue that's happening both uh, internationally and in Washington with the bank and the IMF. Um, I think there's a, a particular uh, interest and uh, it's growing to try to learn from what the experience was and will be. The question was what do the, uh, the Halliburtons of the world uh, have to say and, and lose in this particular process. There is still an awful lot of our tax dollars going into uh, the multinational firms like Halliburton through the Defense Department. Um, it's not going through the MCA. Uh, they don't have a piece of it, um, and I don't see where they would fit into it. Um, so do we feel political pressure from them? I don't. The question was, uh, in the CRS publication that was circulated here uh, concerning pro poor growth, there seems to be either a difference or a dichotomy between uh, just overall economic growth and a growth that targets the, the improvement of the situation for the poor. We believe that in certain countries, uh, just improving the economic situation, improving the economic rate of return on projects, does not in and of itself change the situation of poor people. That's the old trickle down. Trickle down doesn't trickle down, uh, as far as our experience is, in that you must target specific action towards the situation of the poorest parts of the population that will transform their reality and help them move up and take advantage of the opportunities that are there. So just investing in the capital city in improving the transit infrastructure or the trade infrastructure is not necessarily going to get to the poorest farmers. We are advocating and have long advocated for something that targets the poorest members of society. It should also benefit everyone if you really make it work effectively. And so going back to that example of the port in Benin, sure, there's people who work the port are going to make a lot more money, but if a farmer can decrease his cost of export because there's fewer bribes to be paid and you have a more efficient port, you can really uh, improve things. Let me repeat the question. How does the funding flow work? Um, it's a long and complicated process and depends on each country, first of all. In the case of Paraguay, it was this lower level program called the Threshold Program, 30-something million dollars. The program is managed by USAID. And the money is not transferred to the government of Paraguay. It is, they come up with specific proposals, some of the, w which would be purchased by USAID. Let's say they want to improve the, uh, the customs uh, capability 
and they want training for their workers, they want better computer systems and things like that, AID would arrange for that to happen. In another country, we have sometimes uh, secured a fiscal agent, as we call them, which is uh, basically uh, a uh, Deloitte Touche or one of those uh, companies that would act to manage the money and oversee it. So it really depends on the money. The, the important thing, too, is that the money is no year money. It, it doesn't stop at the end of the fiscal year. So the commitment to a particular country goes for a period of time and it remains unless they uh, don't do something correct or there's any misuse of the money. So the control procedures are pretty tight. But it, it's, it's um, what I like about it, it's, it's not very paternalistic at all. Uh, it's not, interesting if I, if I digress a bit, the, the week before I arrived in Paraguay, uh, Taiwan had had a major delegation in Paraguay. And they um, left a $25 million package of benefits to Paraguay. And I asked about it and everybody said, I think it's about a vote in the UN uh, because we don't see where else the money is going to go. This isn't like that. The MCC is very particular about where the money goes, what it's used for, and what the control systems are. Does the MCC, the question was, does the MCC target every country in the world or does it focus in on particular countries? And uh, one, of the, one of the screens that is applied at, in the very first instance is uh, gross domestic product and, and income levels in the country as they're rated. And we've set certain targets for uh, above which we would not uh, consider them. So we're not going to have a Saudi Arabia or a Qatar uh, qualify just because of their income levels are just plain too high. So it's a small majority. All of that is published. So everybody, citizens and countries, can see who qualifies and what's the basis on which they qualify. But it's not for everybody. I must say, as the, as the uh, person who decided to have this as a topic and uh, issued the invitation to Mr. Hackett, it, it's turned out to be much more interesting than I thought it was <laughs> going to be. Uh, I think the details of this are, are, are wonderful, and, and the connections, of course, to. Uh, as Mr. Hackett suggested, a bold endeavor by the administration to influence the behavior and, and political and social structure of other nations as well as elevate the uh, uh, various classes in their society uh, have been very clearly uh, presented. Uh, uh, this has been an extraordinarily interesting evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.